Yes, welcome back. Welcome back at the annual meeting 2020. We will have the next part of the program and we're very excited because this is the part of the Swammerdam lecture. Uh, I hope that you had uh, time to drink something, to take a short walk and during the breakout sessions have a nice discussion with our researchers. But now we will proceed and I'm not alone. I'm with many men in the studio, but uh, our lecturer of today is Hilgo Bruining. There you are. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you, Wilco? Very good, thanks. Yeah. Yes. It's very special to be here with our friends and colleagues. Yes, yeah. yes it is. And uh, you're a child psychiatrist, but you're also getting used to cameras and, and, and studios, right? Yes, we have a little history actually, eh, don't exactly. we? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we did two days of, yeah. an, of an online conference together. Yeah. Psychiatry. Exactly, yeah. Physician psychiatry, As to be specific. Theme, yeah. So we continue along the same lines. Exactly, yes, that's, that's, uh, that's the, the theme of today for you as well. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, we will use Slido all day long, you know that too. Uh, so please, if you find that little cloud, that, that speech cloud in, uh, in your screen, if you touch that, you'll be entered into Slido. And otherwise, you can use your phone. Then you go to slido.com. That is S-L-I-D-O.com. And there you have an event code that you have to enter, and it is hashtag AM2020. You can also use the hashtag on Twitter if you like. So please join us because we want to hear your comments. We want to know what you think. We want to know what you feel, and we want to know your questions because we, uh, we, we love your participation here. Uh, also, a special welcome to the people who just uh, joined us, especially for your lecture. It's possible, right? The Swammerdam, uh, the Swammerdam lecture. I was, uh, I was uh, fascinated by uh, by this uh, this man, a physiologist, a researcher, and uh, he uh, he studied insects a lot. I found out, but he also described the mechanism of breath uh, as as the first one. And he was one of the first that discovered that the male sperm fertilizes the female egg cell. Did you know that? Well, uh, you mean theoretically? <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that he found out about that? No. No, I must right? admit I didn't. No. Big shoes to fill here. Yeah, yeah. Because that was kind of a discovery, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> so today you, you will have the honor to, to, to lecture in his name. Um, you are a doctor. How do, you feel, uh, how do you feel when you present research like this for all the scientists that are watching? Well, uh, it's a challenge and I'm, uh, I'm very grateful and it's, uh, I hope I'll be as interesting as the pure scientists around me. But then again, I think it's a very um, yeah, good thing that we uh, collaborate so closely to really further our patient care through this interaction. And I think in particular the Amsterdam UMC is a very good source and a very good environment to, to link science to clinical practice. Yeah. Exactly. Is, is there still a, a big void there between the clinical and, and the scientific? Well, I think these are very exciting times. I think there's been no time in history yet that we can actually link science to practice as good as we can to the advent of data analytics and, uh, and increasing biological insights. So it's easier. Uh, it's e easier, the more chances to really bridge the gap, so yes. to speak. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, th I think, yeah, especially in Amsterdam, there's a real good fertilization ground to, uh, to meet each other and interact, not only today, but also uh, during normal uh, working days. What so is I so special about the Amsterdam environment? Well, for instance, this, uh, this structure of Amsterdam neuroscience yeah. has a very uh, intrinsic matrix that really tries to, to engage clinicians into science and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Through, on the one hand, the techniques, and on the other hand, topics that really where scientists can meet clinicians. So I really think that's important to stimulate and inspire these type of interactions because sometimes we speak different languages. Exactly. Yeah. So we need translators. Yeah, yeah. you do. <laughs> yeah. You need to learn about each other's language yeah. a little more. But but you're doing that. I see. So at Utrecht, you developed the sensory processing program, and in Amsterdam, you changed your focus to precision therapy. Right for for the neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. So how did that change happen? Well, I don't think it's a real change. I would st I would name no? it a progression. It's, uh, a, it's <laughs> a shift of focus. Well, yeah, I think it would, uh, so. The prickle poly, uh, that's a translation <laughs> for sensory process. It's not really translatable in English. Prickle poly, no, that's a beautiful word. Was well, actually a first attempt to really sort of yeah create more objective handles in neurodevelopmental disorders and. And we, uh, we hope we succeed a little bit, and now we want to actually apply that in more personalized fashion. So I think we're really using everything we developed in Utrecht, for which I'm very grateful, mm -hmm. now in Amsterdam to apply it in the, 
in this new center. So I think it's really has been the sort of preparation stages and the, and the knowledge that we really needed to develop to try to progress to this more personalized outfit. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yes, and, and that's, that's uh, what you're going to talk about, right? Yes. First, uh, but first, we want to uh, discuss something with you. It's quite interesting. Uh, uh, two statements that you created. We created, yeah. We, and we is the team. Yeah, the team here yeah. on the table, yeah. <laughs> we'll, meet them, we'll meet them later. Yeah. So uh, the two statements that you created, and uh, we would like you to answer with a simple yes or no. Uh, on Slido, the first one is DSM-5, obstructs personalized medicine. It obstructs it. If you say yes, why would you say yes? I would say yes because we need more uh, specific knowledge about, uh, to link actually the, the clinical diversity to treatments and DSM-5 are too broad ah. to do so. Okay, yeah. so you would answer yes. Yes. All right, let's see what, let's see what the participants uh, chose. We can see that, uh, yes. Oh, we <laughs> we have a, a, some kind of mirror view, so we cannot we cannot see the right numbers. But I think it's 21 percent. Well, after your recommendation, the yes part grows. You see, <laughs> we're <Yeah>. very influential. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have influence. Uh, there, there we are. Yeah, 90. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, and growing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not it's not not objective anymore because now they have listened to you and they say yes, it does obstruct personalized oh, medicine. I think we've, seems... we've got a very critical audience who yeah, can yeah. think for themselves. Yeah, they can, <laughs> right? Yeah, you're right, probably. And, but we have another statement that we want to uh, uh, ask you about. So let's try if we can see that. Right, precision medicine is only possible with multidisciplinary team science. Please say yes or say no. And of course. Be honest in this, right? Why, Hilgo, this statement? This is also kind of a major yes. Yeah, I think this is the main topic of why we also sit here as, as a team and why we were maybe also invited to give this afternoon lecture because we, we really try to integrate different disciplines, different uh, approaches to really uh, integrate knowledge around patients. And uh, I hope after the the afternoon this will be 100%. Ah, that's, yeah. the, that's the goal, that's the, our aim for the day. Because it's not so easy. <laughs> <laughs> and you still don't want to influence them. But no. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might, uh, might have done that. Yeah. Well, um, that's for now. We know how they feel and we will find out if you are able to change their minds a little more, maybe. And uh, it's time uh, for you uh, to take uh, uh, the stand, the stand. and, and, and yeah. the stage. Thank you. The Swammerdam Lecture by yes. Hilgo Bruining. Good afternoon again, and thanks for the very kind introduction by Kim. And we're ob ob obviously very, very honored that we can give this big lecture on uh, this sort of multimedia presentation, as we call it, on precision medicine for neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, this is a team effort, as I said, so I will first give sort of an overview of our framework and the ambitions that we have that will be followed by more in-depth presentations on the science that we need for it by Klaus, um, Niels and Bas. And in their presentations, we also present videos of the PhDs that contribute to all the work. So we really make it like a Matroska or a Droste effect to show you how we, how we think about team science to use for this purpose. And um, since we're in pandemic spheres, I, I would like take the opportunity to also relate to uh, neurodevelopmental disorders as a pandemic. Because what you see here is that in 1970s, only one in 10,000 children was diagnosed with autism, which now is one in 59 diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And one in five children is diagnosed with some kind of developmental dis disability. And another astonishing figure is that over 5% of children in the United States and Europe are treated with psychotropic medication, mostly ADHD stimulants. But this medication, um, although needed to make life bearable and acceptable and really for the more severe forms it is really necessary, is applied in what we call a trial and error manner. There's no mechanistic rationale, we have no good endpoint to measure it, and we cannot predict response or the serious adverse effects that often accompany these treatments. And to give you a flavor of our um, situation in the clinic and the stories people tell us, this video. Thank 
De reden is dat wij in de opvoeding met Sven tegen bepaalde problemen aanliepen. En ook op school liep het eigenlijk niet goed met Sven. Veel conflictjes, hij was vaak moe, slecht slapen. We hebben al meerdere trajecten doorlopen wat geen resultaat opleverde. In eerste instantie stond via de wijkteam. We kregen opvoedingsadviezen, dat uh, werkt niet. Daarna hebben we een slaappolie geweest waarbij we te horen kregen typisch ADHD slaappatroon, maar ja, er volgt ook niks uit. Vervolgens heeft hij één op één begeleiding gehad naar een orthopedagoog. En na anderhalf jaar was de conclusie Sven weet het allemaal wel, maar hij kan het niet toepassen. So I think the main message of this mother is that our diagnostic syndrome actually is dominant over personal experience. And what I mean by that is if you see on the left here, in the big circles, the main categories listed by DSM as neurodevelopmental disorders, and in the more outer shell, the conditions or um, uh, disorders that often accompany these disorders, and in clinical reality on the right side, you see which symptoms actually coincide in these children, which is a myriad of symptoms. And the problem is that many of children with the same diagnosis have very different clinical profiles and vice versa. Many children with different diagnoses have overlapping syndromes. And obviously this indicates also to very extensive etiological heterogeneity and this system impairs advancement to more accurate treatment or better prognosis. And I think we're not the only field in medicine that struggles with their uh, diagnostic constructs. If you think about COVID, for instance, it's, it's not a question of the doctor and a virus and installing a, th a simple therapy, but it's more that um, we really need to understand the whole ecological picture or breast cancer where the oncologist is not purely giving chemo for a, th for a tumor anymore, but really tries to get a genetic profile of the tumor and understand how much therapy an individual can actually carry or, or endure. And in psychiatry, it's even more complicated, and in child psychiatry as well, because we lack diagnostic objective measures or readouts to actually um, guide these more rational treatment decisions. We have no tissue in hand, and also our treatment endpoints are actually quite poor. In most randomized controlled trials, we use uh, vague um, diagnostic symptom skills that were actually designed for diagnostic purposes and are psychometrically invalid to use as a treatment endpoint. And then uh, from these standpoints of really struggling with our concept, we have devised this roadmap that I want to tell you about. It's a promise, we're not there yet, to implement precision medicine approaches for children with these neurodevelopmental conditions. And we designate three steps. First of all, informing treatments. So we need to link the right treatment, the right child to the right treatment. And if we apply these informed treatments, we need to test them in individualized trial designs in which we can really test efficacy within the individual. And by doing so, we really need to test patient relevant outcomes, so outcomes that really matter to the individual and patient relevant biomarkers so that we can test whether the hypothesized mechanisms are indeed targeted. And you will ap appreciate that all these steps uh, involve a lot of work and a lot of connections, so it's an ideal scenario and something that really requires team science. And it's not our idea, actually, to be very, very careful about diagnostic procedures, because I really have to say that most of our colleagues in child psychiatry and child psychology are extremely rigorous and very ambitious to collect all kinds of clinical information when new child children come to their institutions like perinatal history, imaging, family history, therapy history, cognitive profiles, learning performances, school observations. But then something weird happens. Because after that, we, are in, we really are mandated by uh, reimbursement agencies like uh, insurance companies, or, govern or governmental bodies to go back to diagnostic labels because that is the only way people can get access to care of treatment. Well, ideally, we would like to integrate these characteristics in more detailed predictions of treatment, etc. Especially now with the advent of more complex data analytic techniques. But before we can do so, we really need this handle, this objective measurement, this framework 
so that we can actually combine these, these children into a construct that we can use to redevelop and redefine our clinical um, boundaries and treatments. And I think the, um, the, the balance between excitation and inhibition balance is a theme that you'll be hearing more this afternoon. Because what, what do we mean by that? That in the brain, a balance between excitation and inhibition is very crucial to maintain proper information processing. And with too much excitation, as you probably know, you can even get seizures. And if the brain is silenced too much, like in a coma, there's no cognitive information processes, good cognitive processing either. And it's already long known that, in, uh, that autism and epilepsy coincide in about 30% of cases, that the sensory difficulties of children with neurodevelopmental disorders also indicate aberrant brain activity regulation. And another interesting phenomenon that over 50% of patients with neurodevelopmental disorders have some kind of EEG abnormality, ranging from background slowing to genuine spike wave complexes. But so far, we have not been able to use this information for clinical decision making. And we think that we can, because although it is a complex framework and it is maintained at different uh, levels, from molecular levels to, to more network regulation, it is at the same time a very promising network, uh, framework, because we can use it to, to create readouts at different biological levels that we can then link to one another to really inform treatments from the mechanistic to the more phenotypical um, level. And uh, what you see here from the left to the right is that the genetic level, there's many so-called rare variants identified in children with neurodevelopmental disorders, and collectively they have been um, thought to act in this final common pathway of excitatory inhibitory cell lineages. And uh, that also allowed many studies of animal models testing these rare variants and studying their effect on synapses and cellular phenotypes. And now, um, I'll show you, we have also ways to actually measure uh, EI at the network level. And importantly, for in the, in for the, at, the, at the end where we want to choose an intervention and to link, for instance, the cellular to the more cortical level, there's many existing medications that target different elements of EI. So we have a menu to choose from if we stay within this framework. And Niels Cornelissen will speak about more in depth about this very interesting technique that we can actually also study EI cellular phenotypes in patient-owned neurons. We will harvest skin biopsies in our consortium from, uh, from children and, there and, and uh, harvest their stem cells to derive neuronal networks in the patient-owned genetic background and then test what kind of electrophysiological or cellular properties they have. And we can actually also subject these to therapies in vitro. And then this network level. I met Klaus Linkenkaar Hansen, who will also be speaking after me uh, a couple of years ago on an EEG conference, where else? And he told me about his fascination for a physics framework um, in which he thought that he could actually directly derive EI measurements from mass brain activity, such as in EEG signals. And his theories has to do with the, the relationship between the entropy of temporal correlations in the signal in relation to the power or the strength of the signal, he'll tell you all about it. But at the end of the day, he succeeded to create a direct readout per signal that you can sort of see as an estimation of the overall EI ratio in, the, uh, in that network. And the interesting thing about that is that obviously we can apply that to our clinical queries and to test whether this hypothesis of excitation, inhibition, imbalances in neurodevelopmental disorders hold true. And what you see here is that in our, in our sample of unmedicated children with autism, we applied uh, this, this algorithm and compared it with TDC, and red means there's a higher EI value in autism, and blue, there's lower than TDC. And here you see that on average, there was no difference between TDC here and autism. But in the extremes, you might appreciate that there's extensive variability, so there are individuals indeed with excessive excitation or excessive inhibition, and also children that seem to have overall, when you average this out over the brain, a balanced EI ratio outcome. And this already is very important because this, is, this tells us that if we apply medication that, for instance, uh, suppresses inhibition or excitation, we cannot just use it as one size fits all because one end of the spectrum may be harmed by such 
um, unspecified application. And then we asked ourselves, can we explain this uh, EI variability a bit more? And can we progress to some, something like a physiological stratification of autism? And because we had this hypothesis that these EEG abnormalities, these visual abnormalities, which I showed you earlier, might relate also to EI or aberrant activity regulation, we tested whether the children with these EEG abnormalities, so these background abnormalities or epileptiform changes, were different from children with autism that did not have these abnormalities. And indeed, what we found was that children with EEG abnormalities, so ASD abnormal, had a significantly lower average over the whole brain EI ratios than the children without these abnormalities. And when we then compared the children without any abnormalities, so sort of clean ASD, let's put it that way, to typically developing, then we found that that subcohort was actually characterized by very high EI ratios. So this is the beginning of a physiological stratification that we might actually use in treatment perspective. And for the treatment perspective, I already hinted to that there is a very interesting menu to choose from. Because what you see here, Lisa Geertjens, our medical, new medical PhD in the consortium, has uh, created an overview of all the possible medications we could use to target different elements of EI, either GABAergic, inhibitory or glutamatergic excitatory. And the ones that are uh, in a, with bigger fonts are the ones that have been tested in multiple trials in neurodevelopmental conditions. And, but all of them are actually off-label uh, possible, so we can actually use them in this end of one setting. And what you might appreciate is that these, these, that these uh, testing these uh, individual components in uh, conventional clinical trials will not deliver as much as you would expect because we hypothesize that due to this EI heterogeneity, you have to stratify first. And indeed, most of these compounds that were tested in unstratified autism populations, for instance, failed to show overall efficacy. So we thought we needed to do that better. And therefore, we focused on this one here, bumetanide. Why bumetanide? Well, I think it's a very interesting compound, especially from the perspective of developmental disorders. Because bumetanide is a diuretic drug, or it is known as a diuretic drug, but now we apply it in a neurological fashion, that can antagonize a chloride importer and it can lower chloride levels when they have remained high. And high chloride levels render GABA, the normal, normal, uh, normally known as an inhibitory trans, uh, neurotransmitter, excitatory. And if it can lower um, elevated chloride levels, it can sort of reinstate GABAergic inhibition. And many uh, different animal models have shown indeed that this uh, developmental lowering of chloride has not taken place and that that may be part of EI dysregulation in some patients. And another interesting feature about this drug is that sometimes we see that patients with neurodevelopmental disorders have so-called paradoxical responses to GABAergic drugs. So you expect sedation, but you get arousal or aggression. And this case report was an eight-year-old girl that literally drew off the curtains when she got Valium for her first seizure and there we sort of gained proof of concept that indeed the EEG power mechanism was sort of the mirror image of what you would normally obtain after giving a uh, GABAergic drug. And from that, we did a lot of work. And this slide is really uh, uh, sort of six years of work in Utrecht, and it's mainly due to these champions of trials, Jan Sprengers and Dorinde van Andel. They're still in Utrecht finishing their PhDs now. And we managed to finish uh, three trials. The first trial, we had the hypothesis that if we can use EEG and we run it along, which has never done before in an autism trial, strangely enough, maybe we can stratify the treatment response variability by incorporating EEGs. The second one was that the hypothesis that if we only select children with a certain genetic disorder that is preclinically associated with chloride homeostasis dysregulation, we might get good results as well. And the third one was that we had this idea that sensory intolerance, sensory hypersensitivity might be particularly an asset to predict treatment response um, uh, enhancement. So what you see here is that uh, to be able to compare these three trials, we tested the same endpoint in each trial, social behavior, repetitive behavior and irritable behavior. And if you see a blue bar, it's a child with, that received bumetanide treatment and an orange one is uh, placebo. 
And I want to focus especially on the Bambi trial here on the left. Because you might appreciate here that the left, that there are some promising results because all the real, the best responders have all received bumetanide, about 12 children out of uh, 92 competitors. But there's also the case that there's many placebo effects sort of in the same range and there are some bumetanide children totally on the right. So we want to dissect this or explain this treatment response variability and also be sure that these effects are really due to, to a neurological uh, effect on oscillations. So first of all, we use the EEG to test whether indeed bumetanide and not placebo change, for instance, this FEI um, uh, biomarker. And this was a very promising result because after 91 days of treatment, there was only a significant change in this FEI ratio in bumetanide and not in placebo, and it nicely went back after the washout period of 119 days. And another interesting thing is obviously that we can try and towards more personalized application to test is the baseline EEG uh, profile of a patient indicative maybe of future response or future non-response. And what you see here is that the children with a favorable response on this primary endpoint SRS uh, tended to have supercritical, so above one, indicating hyperexcitable, the children without EEG abnormalities um, a profile, while the children without or a less favorable response tended to be below one. So here's the beginning. These values above one indicate a favorable response and the ones below one tend to associate with a negative or less favorable response. And this video now shows what Mama said about treatment effects. We hebben meegedaan met een trial voor de bumetanide. Dat is, dat is uh, een medicijn om de prikkelverwerking te verbeteren. En dat sloeg heel goed aan. We hadden echt we hadden een heel ander kind in huis. Ja, meer ontspanning en rust. En ook op school ging het uh, duidelijk beter in de contacten met andere kinderen. Oké, okay, I must admit. Of course, we selected somebody who had a, had a good response, but on the other hand, it is very impressive because so far we did not have any other treatment to really improve the situation of these children. So at least for this mother and, and Sven, it has been an improvement. But we want to go further because, as I said, this is sort of a stratification exercise. How can, how can we get from stratification to prediction for the individual? Well, this is a, a very busy slide, and I'm still a bit puzzled by this tulip, which is always in the way in our slides, so sorry for that. But um, uh, we, what we do is that we, um, uh, we incorporate this, these labels, have the bumetanide, so true responders, false responders, placebo responders. We incorporate it in, into a machine learning algorithm together with some clinical characteristics. And ideally, we want to select the most discriminating features test them and validate them into a classifier that in future patients, if we, if we um, gather the same diagnostic information, so basically EEG and some clinical characteristics, that we will be able to predict the same response for that patient um, before embarking on treatment. And as a proof of concept, Giannina Christian, that's our statis statistic statistical uh, PhD, did a lot of work on this and we're very proud to show after all this training and validation, our first results, that indeed we can, for instance, delineate bumetanide versus placebo um, children. That's maybe not clinically so relevant for future per patients, but indeed that is important that we want to really be sure that bumetanide has a different effect than placebo. But what is a clinical relevant res result is here, that uh, by incorporating only six EEG features, the ones in red here, we could predict 84% accuracy that children will have a six point, that was actually the power of that scale that was superior uh, in the trial, to, have a, to obtain that result, to be a responder, so to speak. And this out of sample figure that you see in the in the, on, the, on, the, on the right is that we set aside certain individual, individuals because we don't have a genuine replication sample as yet to test whether it would prove as, as well in that sort of validation sample of a small set of children. That's a very conservative estimate, so in reality I think we will be very close to predict around 80%. Also, because at this moment we only included alpha EEG biomarkers. We did not include any other clinical characteristics yet, so just EEG already obtained this very good result. So that's very hopeful, and what we will be doing in um, to 
to actually confirm these, these predictions, but also novel predictions, once we, once we combine the cellular and the EEG um, readouts to really predict in, the, in our future uh, setup of, of genuine uh, personalized treatments, that we want to test, as I said, these predictions in individualized trials. Bas Tunneberg will tell you in detail about this, but what it, what it actually means is that we will conduct repeated single trial randomized placebo-controlled uh, uh, blocks of treatment, and then we will conduct multiple measurements in each block, and, uh, and, and uh, even the patient report outcome measures each week, to really get a dynamic view on how it changes and when the minimal clinical important difference is actually obtained for that patient. So the, the quintessence really is we, the patient is his or her own control in terms of receiving multiple treatments and multiple measurements. And then we will use probabilistic Bayesian statistics to be able to actually, as an elegant way, to compare whether the likelihood ratio, so the actual result of these N of 1 trials, these single patient trials, and compare that with the prior probability as an indication, as an example which I just showed you, but then calculated with more Bayesian uh, frameworks, and to integrate these two to actually come to a posterior probability to see whether um, uh, we should continue or discontinue trial, trials and, and whether uh, we think this is a feasible approach. And together, we can actually use a Bayesian uh, hierarchical model to, uh, to actually predict the effectiveness of, this, of treatments either for the, for the individual but also aggregate it on the group level. But Bas tell tell, will tell you more about it, about this very important element of our, um, of our plan. And this... Um, Together, what I've shown you, we've collapsed it into an animation by the impressive work of, of Jochem Thames, who also works for the, the broadcasting company that we're happy to be with today. And this animation uh, will also be used to show patients and caregivers and stakeholders and collaborators in science to really uh, entice them for this approach that I've been talking about. So, here you see Sami. He is placed in the diagnostic framework, as I said. We call it the Da Vinci scan. It's an invention by Lisa. I think it's a very good name. And through the Da Vinci scan, we indicate which features, in this case from Sven, these are real-time features. He's a nine-year-old boy, sensory issues, had a grade two EEG abnormality, had prior treatment responses and some cognitive problems. We integrate it, as I said, into this EI indicator, combination of EEG and cellular diagnosis. We link it to the most optimal treatment, and then we subject the child to these multiple single patient trials until we obtain a minimal clinical important difference on the basis of these patient report outcome measures, EEG, and other biomarkers, and we also validate it towards conventional skills. If successful, we don't do anything else, but if not successful or not sufficiently successful, we add a second treatment just until we either are satisfied or we, we think we cannot offer any further treatment, because that's also possible. But we iterate, re, we reiterate, so to speak, this whole scheme. And one thing I want to say before you start asking questions about that, this example is about medications for EI, but obviously other strategies like um, uh, TMS or, uh, or therapies could also um, uh, be useful in this kind of framework. But this is an example because we really focus on EI medications. So how is this all funded? Because we, uh, we obviously need some money to, to link all these different parts of informing, performing and monitoring treatments. Uh, this is funded by the so-called NWA, the National Science Agenda uh, of NWO. And we're very happy and very proud that we obtained that funding because we literally put forward this framework and it's, uh, this promise that we really think we can get to measuring all these different elements of pure biology and pure symptoms and integrate them into this framework. So we have around four to five years now to really uh, provide, show proof of concept. But already, I really want to emphasize, and I'm happy to end with this slide before I give the word to Klaus, is that it is so inspiring that we don't no longer just do science to, for our own good or to get very serious results, but that if we have uh, precision meetings with nanobiology or about patient report measures or EEG, it is directly always about how can we bring it back to these individualized treatments. 
And that is really a change of perspective that is really, I think, uh, felt as really inspirational for all partners and all people we collaborate with. And it's not only in Amsterdam, but uh, pharmacists uh, that support us, some consortia and... Um, um, yeah, this, so I think ultimately we want to help Sven and that is very inspirational and this team science effort geared towards this integration of knowledge is a way forward I think that will be uh, for at least the coming years something we can build upon. And I put there dot 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 center question mark because after the presentation we'll show you what kind of name we have invented that really think covers uh, our ambitions and um, how we want to go further with children and caregivers and obviously our collaborators. Thank you. Questions are coming in. Please enter them in Slido. We will answer them later. Uh, thanks for your contribution. With us now, Associate Professor Integrative Neurophysiology, Klaus Linkenkeer Hansen. So, as Hilko just uh, pointed out, um, there are several lines of, uh, of evidence suggesting that neurodevelopmental neuro disorders are associated with uh, EI dysregulation. And there are already many existing drugs that act on EI regulating synaptic mechanisms and that we would like to use EEG to help doing treatment decisions. So that of course prompts the question, how does EI balance affect EEG signals? So let's recap what is EEG. In order to get a measurable EEG signal at the scalp level, you need to synchronize the activity of thousands of neurons. And this is brought about in the brain through a resonant interaction between excitatory and inhibitory cells. Exactly how many neurons are recruited in each cycle of excitation and inhibition varies a lot from cycle to cycle, and it is reflected in the amplitude of the oscillation. What we want to understand is this dynamical process in a framework of EI balance. But EI interactions are not only important for setting up oscillations. It's fundamental for regulating the flow of information in the brain. Sy homostatic mechanisms regulate synaptic connections to prevent that the gain of networks are too high, that we don't get too much excitation, which would run which would lead to too much activity in the brain, or that we don't have too much inhibition, which would prevent the propagation of activity. Now, in biology, this concept of gain is a qualitative one, actually EI balance as well, even though it has been around for many decades. But in statistical physics, the concept of gain equal one comes with a rich statistical framework called critical dynamics. It is exactly when a network is critical that is capable of producing a rich pattern of activity. Now, if you still are not totally familiar with the gain, just think of it as the reproduction number. This is now monitored every single day and week around the world to keep track on how are we doing with containing the virus spreading. In fact, there's a striking similarity between the spreading of the COVID-19 virus and the waves of spiking activity in the computational model that I will soon present. But it was not um, the spreading of COVID-19 that got me interested in complex fluctuations of critical networks. It was the seminal work by Pierre Bach on self-organized criticality. So he discovered that many dynamical systems in nature actually become attracted to this peculiar state where you see rich patterns of activity. And they have the statistical hallmark of a 1RF spectrum, which indicate that there are long-range temporal correlations in the activity. I was intrigued by the idea that the complex fluctuations and spontaneous oscillations in the human brain reflect that the underlying brain networks are operating close to the critical state. So to test this hypo hypothesis, I measured alpha oscillations during eyes closed rest in humans using MEG and EEG. And what we discovered is that the amplitude modulations of these spontaneous oscillations indeed follow the statistical hallmark of a critical process with long-range temporal correlations. So to understand 
the mechanisms behind these long-range temporal correlations or critical fluctuations and oscillations, we decided to develop what we now call the critical oscillations model. In this model, we can independently vary the amount of excitatory and inhibitory connectivity. And depending on what the ratio is, we will either get weak short-lived oscillations, sustained high amplitude oscillations, or for some parameter settings, we will see this complex variation in oscillatory activity that we're used to seeing from our MED recordings in humans. The important take-home message here is to be found in this phase diagram, because it turns out that no matter how many inhibitory connections you put into the network, you can get critical oscillations as long as you compensate the increasing amount of inhibitory connectivity by a suitable amount of excitatory connectivity. In other words, to get critical oscillations, you need a balance between excitation and inhibition. Now, EI balance as a qualitative concept has been around in biology for a while, and we now realize that with this model, maybe we could derive an algorithm that could actually give a quantitative measure of this with a theoretical framework behind it. So what we learned from the cross model is that when we go from an inhibition to an excitation-dominated regime, the amplitude of the oscillations go monotonously up, whereas at some balance point you get maximum temporal structure. Unfortunately, neither of these metrics can tell us whether we are in the inhibition or the excitation-dominated regime. But this is where Richard Hartstone got the clever idea to do a sliding window analysis, as indicated by the animation here to the left, because when we are in the inhibition-dominated regime, you will see that there is a positive correlation between the fluctuations in amplitude and the temporal structure, whereas in, when you're in the inhibition-dominated regime, you see a negative correlation between these two meshes. And when there's balance, you get no correlations. So if we introduce a functional measure of EI ratio as 1 minus this correlation, you get an intuitive metric that attains the value of 1 when there's balance in the underlying networks. So to validate the method, we measured a large group of students. If you look at the scalp topography of the 257 students, you will see that the EI values are pretty close to 1. There might be some brain regions where it's a little bit higher and some where it's, where it's a little bit lower. But if you average the FEI value across all 128 electrodes for each subject and build a probability distribution, what you see is that the average of this distribution is 0 0.99. Now, you have to realize that if you work for more than 20 years with the hypothesis that the human brain might be operating close to criticality, getting that value does mean um, something to you, um, and hopefully to you too. Another way of validating the model is to simulate what happens to the FEI index if we monitor oscillations when we increase the inhibitory decay time constant in the model. And what we see is that the FEI value goes down. We also validated it by administering Solpidem to healthy volunteers. And what we see is that the FEI value transiently goes down and then back up in the washout period. On my last slide, I would like to leave the technical details aside and zoom out on what I call the theory of critical brain dynamics and explain why I find it so appealing for integrative and translational neuroscience. What I've been trying to, to make a point out of is that propagation of activity is a fundamentally important phenomenon at any level of neural organization, as we see it over here. In fact, we expect some sort of balance at each one of these levels. And there has been already evidence for critical dynamics reported at many of these different levels. So this is why we think that for the NVA consortium, it is a very useful concept and framework for studying uh, potential mechanistic uh, disturbances in neurodevelopmental disorders and from my perspective, some of the mechanisms where we could also intervene might be at the very high level. And for that, I would like to go back to the COVID-19 analogy. A couple of weeks ago, two French tourists flew from Paris to Iceland and infected 100 people there. I think there's no doubt 
that this macroscopic intervention of stopping flights from going between Paris and Iceland would be one way of containing, helping contain the, uh, this epidemic. Now, working across these different levels within the NVA consortium does make me optimistic uh, and, 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 and a bit excited because I have this personal vision to develop a theory of critical brain dynamics with clinical and commercial applications. And I'm beginning to feel that not only do I have the tools, but also the right network of people around me to actually book some progress with this vision in the coming years. And for that, and to that end, I would also like to, to put attention towards my PhD students. Um, I find it a complete privilege that so many talented young people come to me and want to work on this idea uh, for many, many years. And therefore, I'm also very happy to show, them, show you all a little video that we made to um, uh, give the word to my PhD students who will present themselves and what they are doing. Hi, my name is Arthur Avramia and my background is in artificial intelligence. Hi, my name is Marina Diachenko. I have background in bioinformatics. Hi, my name is Simon Houtman. My background is in artificial intelligence and neuroscience. Hi, I am Erika Juarez and I am a neurologist with training in clinical EEG analysis and a main focus on epilepsy. In this team, I work on developing computation models where we can mechanistically manipulate EI balance. And my role in the team is to apply deep learning to predict uh, artifacts in EEG data. Children with autism spectrum disorders are known to have high incidence of EEG abnormalities, including epileptiform ones. And that's why in our team, we review the EEGs of these children and look for specific uh, EEG abnormalities and if they're present or not. Together with Hilgo and Klaus, I uh, combine methods from AI with new measures from the EEG to find subgroups within autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. My work currently is to understand how EI balance regulates information processing in the brain. One way to do that is to stimulate a network and to see how it reacts at different levels of EI balance. Another way of studying information processing is to connect two networks and to see how they communicate with each other as a function of EI balance. The model I developed predicts the probability of an artifact. This probability is color-coded and visualized alongside the signal. And in red, there is a high probability uh, of an artifact. And we can recognize this artifact if we look up here on the actual signal. So in these EEGs, we look for abnormalities, for example, as slowing of activity or epileptiform activity. And for example, here we have an EEG recording where we see a pattern of sharp wave and slow wave that seems to be coming from the temporal lobe and that could be related to epilepsy. I'm currently working on a source modeling pipeline where we try to estimate the sources of activity inside the brain. So my work involves a lot of coding and it is very computationally intensive. If I had to run this on my laptop, instead of the LISA cluster where I run it, it would have taken about 15 years, so I wouldn't have been able to finish my PhD in time. We hope to refine and further improve the model to apply it in clinic and help clinicians to make better decisions when recording brain activity in patients with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So here we test the relationship between the qualitative EEG analysis and the quantitative EEG analysis. And we hope that by understanding the link between these two, we can better understand the clinical complexity of the disorder. By combining new measures of brain activity from the EEG and developing new tools for stratification, we aim to find meaningful subgroups within autism that can inform treatment strategies. And now, already prepared and there, Research Associate Clinical Genetics, Niels Cornelissen. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. 
Um, I'm happy that I can tell something about our role in this project, uh, which is the cellular phenotyping of patients with neurodevelopmental disorders. And um, the reason why we want to go to the cellular level is that the EI balance that uh, Hilge and Klaus talked about quite extensively, uh, which might be implicated in these disorders, uh, of course, originates from the, um, the, the interplay between uh, glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons in neuronal networks in the brain. So the uh, cellular properties of the cell actually uh, tune the uh, EI balance in these networks. Um, so what are the uh, actual parameters then that uh, control EI balance in these networks? So one of the obvious parameters is, of course, the number of glutamatergic and GABAergic synapses in these uh, networks. And if you uh, look at the left side, there's an image of a neuron, and all the green dots there represent uh, one uh, glutamatergic uh, synapse. And you can imagine that if you have uh, many or more of these uh, glut glutamatergic synapses, that your network is tilted to a more excited uh, state. So another important uh, parameter is the synaptic strength. Uh, of glutamatergic and uh, GABAergic neurons in this network. And also the excitability, variation in the excitability uh, for different neurons in these networks can uh, tune the AI balance in the networks. So over the years in our department, uh, we developed several uh, methods to uh, measure these cellular and synaptic parameters. So on the left side, for instance, you see a computer program that we developed and that we use a lot to um, to, to quantify the uh, morphology of neurons in culture. For instance, we can uh, nicely track down the, uh, the dendritic structure of these neurons, and we can also count the number of synapses per neuron. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see um, a more functional analysis that we do of uh, synaptic transmission in these networks, um, uh, where we use the PET clamp technique to uh, record uh, synaptic transmission between neurons. And um, uh, we can um, record spontaneous fusion of vesicles, but also we can record the synaptic strength, which is def defined as the postsynaptic response to a presynaptic uh, exponential. And then also, on top of that, we can uh, measure also the variation or the plasticity of synaptic strength uh, over time when you stimulate, for instance, with multiple exponentials. Now, with these uh, tools that we developed and established in the functional genomics department, you see a, a group picture of one of the lab outings that we had. Uh, we spent over two decades of studying uh, genes and proteins that are involved in synapse formation and controlling synaptic strength. And over time, we acquired quite a lot of knowledge and insight in what all these proteins and genes are doing and which processes they are involved in. And interestingly, some of the proteins that we uh, study uh, in, in great detail that are associated with um, uh, the, the fusion of uh, vesicles that contain neurotransmitter to the, to the plasma membrane of the synapse, those uh, uh, snare molecules and also snare-related molecules are actually... Uh, mutations in those genes are associated with uh, neuro neurodevelopmental symptoms in patients. So based on all the... Um, the knowledge and uh, evidence the, that we acquired for function of these proteins and genes uh, in the synapse, both from the presynapse and the postsynapse. Uh, recently, uh, there was an initiative that was led by uh, Matthijs Verhagen and Guus Smit, where they started the SYNGO consortium to annotate genes and, and their function. Um, and together with uh, our friends and colleagues in the synaptic field, we annotated over 1,000 genes and identified about 180 processes that play a role in, uh, in regulating synaptic strength in, in synapses and uh, forming synapse formation. So the question now, of course, this was all uh, data that was uh, gathered in, in animal models. And the question then is, of course, can we also use these tools that we developed and all this knowledge to study the same processes in synapses and cells um, in, in human neurons, and uh, especially human neurons of uh, patients? So in the next video, um, a PhD student of mine, Mike uh, van Boven, will tell you more about the approach that we took to, uh, to be able to do this. I'm Mike van Boven and I'm a PhD student in the lab of Niels Cornelissen. We aim to study cellular phenotypes of children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And since we don't have directly access to brain tissue from children, we make neurons here in the lab using stem cell technology. 
Using a small punch, we take a tiny piece of skin from the patient, and from this piece of skin, we derive fibroblasts. Next, by expressing reprogramming factors, we derive iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells, from these fibroblasts. We can differentiate these stem cells into neurons, and we do this again using transcription factors. Based on the combination of transcription factors used, we can either make glutamatergic neurons, which are excitatory, or GABAergic neurons, which are inhibitory. By mixing these two cell types together, we can make human neuronal networks, which allow us to study the cellular and the network properties of patient-derived neurons. In the first approach, we use CRISPR-Cas9 technology to repair the uh, mutation from the patient, and then we can compare phenotypes in these two cell lines. The second approach involves creating the mutation in control cell lines, which are also compared to each other. About six months after taking the skin biopsy, the neurons are ready to be measured, which is what we do here at the electrophysiology rig. We use a patch clamp technique, which is a very sensitive method to, to measure electrical activity in single cells. This can be either action potentials or synaptic input coming from other cells in the network. This technique allows us to very accurately measure communication between neurons and how this may be affected by um, our patient's mutation. With this approach, we hope to uncover disease mechanisms and to gain a better understanding of these mechanisms, which may ultimately help in finding new therapies. Yes, yeah, so in this video, Mike uh, nicely explained that we use this inducible pluripotent stem cells, the iPSCs, to generate, uh, using different transcription factors, um, networks of uh, GABAergic and uh, glutamatergic neurons in a mix. Um, and indeed, when we use this technique, we can um, uh, uh, culture uh, human neurons in a dish uh, that uh, nicely mature over time into fully developed neurons. Uh, as you can see here, with a nice uh, dendritic structure and also uh, with a robust expression of synaptic markers. And we see that these sciences also fully develop uh, over time and producing robust uh, electrophysiological responses in uh, response to uh, exponential stimulation. Also, we showed that um, we can make micro networks of these human neurons in a dish uh, that express both uh, GABAergic and uh, glutamatergic neurons. So now we know how to make this uh, human neurons, and especially human neurons also of patients, we can test indeed cellular phenotypes um, of neurodevelopmental disorders, for instance, autism spectrum, spectrum disorders. And this is one of the projects within, um, within our consortium. We have this top-down approach, and we actually, that means that we, we select patients uh, based on their uh, response to a certain treatment, in this case, bumetanide, that Hilge also explained and also the uh, EG uh, biomarkers from, from Klaus. This is from this Bambi study. Uh, and then we are able to test, for instance, in this uh, patients that respond uh, very well to bumethanide, whether indeed uh, GABA is less uh, inhibitory or even excitatory in these cells. So we can directly test this in the, in, the, in the neurons of these patients. We can also measure whether the effect of bumethanide, as uh, I thought it was, uh, or is predicted to be, that it restores the uh, reverse potential for GABA, if that is indeed the case in these cells. But also interestingly, we have also this group of patients that do not respond to bumethanide, and then we have this whole um, uh, range of uh, AI targeting drugs that uh, Hilge also explained and showed that we can try to see if, if AI balance in these patients' uh, neurons are uh, altered, whether we can restore this actually by uh, uh, using different drugs. And these cellular outcomes then will inform uh, uh, decisions about uh, therapy in, uh, in end of one trials that uh, Bas uh, Stunenberg will talk about in the next presentation. So another project is where we have a more uh, bottom-up approach, where we study uh, de novo mutations in, in a synaptic tegmin. Um, and this is a bottom-up approach because we know now uh, what the, this molecule is doing in the synapse, and we are particularly interested in the mutations, what kind of cellular phenotypes they give. And later on, then we will compare this with the phenotypes that we will find, for instance, 
then we test uh, the EEG in, in Hilgos' uh, lab. So, um, briefly about synaptotegmin, it's a very important molecule in the synapse, and you can see it as a gatekeeper of the synapse because um, it, in, it prevents the spontaneous fusion of vesicles, but it uh, actually translates the extra potential into uh, fusion of vesicles and thereby producing a robust synaptic response. And the mutation that uh, we study now was uh, brought to us by uh, Petra Zweinenberg from, uh, um, from the clinical genetics department. And this was a mutation uh, at the position that is highly conserved in this molecule. And um, just to briefly, briefly show some of the first results, this is from Michael van Bovis. He showed that if you overexpress this mutant on a wild-type background just to mimic the heterozygous mutation in the patient, and this is a mouse neurons, uh, I have to say, to say that the, um, the, the synaptic response is less synchronized to the exponential. And there's a, the, the, the response is more delayed, there's a longer decay. And in addition, also the spontaneous fusion of vesicles uh, is increased. So together this means that there seems to be a decreased signal-to-noise ratio in these glutamatergic uh, cells. So now the human neurons are, uh, that carry this mutation are on the way that we expect to measure in, in January. Um, so the things that we want to do, of course, is to see if this phenotype holds also in human neurons, and then to test what the consequences are for cellular EI balance in human networks, of course, of this um, mutation. Um, also, we want, like I said, test this uh, patient uh, using the EI uh, biomarkers from Klaus, from EEG. And then finally, if the EI balance is changed um, in this patient, we can try at the cellular level first uh, different EI targeting drugs to inform NF1 trials in this patient. So I would like to finish with the last slide, also on team science, which is also a little bit of the, the theme of this meeting of today. So we are really happy uh, that we can contribute with our cellular assays to all the other assays that are used in this consortium to come to a kind of personalized uh, medicine approach for patients. Um, in that context, I also would like to mention uh, our friends from uh, Twente University, the nanotech team, which are working on uh, new ways to upscale our um, functional analysis um, uh, using chip technology. And I would uh, like to finish with a great example, I think, of team science that we have in our group, in our department. Uh, that's the FGA human neuron team, because all the work that we do on human neurons is really a big collaborative effort of many talented and skilled uh, technicians and PhD students and postdocs in our lab. And it's really an, an, an honor and a blessing to work with these people on this, uh, exciting, in this exciting new field. Thank you. Thank you, Niels Cornelissen. Yes, and Bas is preparing. We, uh, we, we really like your questions coming in, but please uh, add a little more if you, if you want. And you can also vote for the questions that have been entered already. So then we know later on when we talk to these gentlemen all together that we will uh, answer the most urgent questions and the thing, or, or, or the most interesting ones probably. Um, can I please now have your attention for a neurologist, Bas Stunenberg? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to uh, present uh, before you after uh, my colleagues. Uh, maybe I'm a bit blessed that their stories have already been told, so I can uh, make sure to point them all together in these um, N of 1 trials that we're going to discuss and the Bayesian statistics that you can use to uh, analyze these trials. And of course, all with the goal to personalize treatment and neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. Um, I would like to start by uh, taking you to the journey from experience or eminence-based medicine to evidence-based medicine where we're in at the moment. Uh, a nice uh, picture here uh, is shown uh, from um, the famous neurologist Charcot in Paris in the uh, end of um, 18th, 19th century, I should say. And he is demonstrating a fainting woman with hysteria and the whole crowd is watching. There are some famous other neurologists like Babinski there, um, also famous psychiatrists. So I think it's also a link to this nice collaboration between neurology and psychiatry uh, in neuroscience. So this is really a patient-centered approach. And um, well, we all know that we're now living in an evidence-based medicine world. Um, and although uh, when the evidence-based working group announced and coined this term of evidence-based medicine, 
uh, as use of the best current evidence uh, in making decisions about the care of individual patients with clinical expertise and patient values and best research evidence. We all know that, especially in macroeconomic decisions, um, especially the randomized controlled trial have become uh, the center of evidence-based medicine. And it's the question whether uh, we should all accept this. Uh, so that brings me to the next slide of the paradox of evidence-based medicine, because also already discussed by Hilgo, we're in a bit in this evidence-based um, uh, zone between clinical care and clinical medicine. And Although the randomized control trial have uh, brought us a lot, we also know that in some populations, especially when they're really heterogeneous or when it's small populations, rare diseases, we cannot rely on results from randomized control trials. And this brings this problem, uh, especially to us as physicians, uh, in the consultation room together with the patient, what to rely on. Uh, because often your patient does not fit the strict inclusion criteria of these trials, and on the other hand, the alternative that you have, so the other end of the paradox, is treating patients with informal trials where you give a treatment and ask a patient to come back in a couple of weeks and then discuss a possible treatment effect based on often subjective information and no real systematic collection of data. So is there a solution uh, to bridge this evidence gap? Um, well, of course, um, there is, and I will uh, explain it after this slide, uh, another statistical pitfall of personalized medicine that has also um, clearly been demonstrated by Senedal in this uh, nice um, uh, editorial in Nature in 2018 is that just one drug does not test whether the drug works. Um, it does on average uh, for the total group, but it does not really say that a responder in this one go with the drug uh, can really help you to predict patients in clinical practice. So he's actually uh, pleading to measure each patient twice uh, to really see, and that's demonstrated here, that if you have a first comparison and a second comparison, you need to be and select the responders that are in the top right corner here uh, to really make sure which drugs um, well, have a consistent response and that could be the drugs that could be helpful for patients. Uh, so another nice editorial uh, in 2015 in Nature um, said, well, maybe it's time for N of 1 trials. And N of 1 trials are these single patient randomized controlled crossover trials, um, actually the crossover trial in the individual patient. And in these trials, you can test the placebo against a second, against a drug or two comparative drugs against each other. And each patient uh, will then underwent or undergo multiple comparisons, each divided by a washout period, until you are convinced that the drug that you're testing works or it does not work. And then you can stop your individual end of one trial. So it's quite adaptive and flexible. Um, and this is not new because end of one trials were part of medicine well, for ages, especially also by, uh, used by psychologists. Uh, but maybe the, uh, the newer thing now why these N of 1 trials have regained new interest is because you can combine N of 1 trial, trial data and then use Bayesian probabilistic statistics to analyze it in a more intuitive way. And maybe also again to um, catch back on the COVID pandemic, it's not strange to, um, well, to use these probabilistic statistics in our everyday life as physicians to see whether uh, the chances of a disease, whether they are um, um, whether increased or decreased by a test. So you have a pre-test probability, post-test probability to discard the diagnosis or maybe to make a diagnosis, but also just in everyday life when you walk outside, you look at the sky, you see cloudy sky, well, you think, what is the prob what's the probability uh, that it's going to rain and should I wear my raincoat? So it is not what we're used to with frequentistic statistics when you talk about um, uh, p-values, confidence intervals, and a hypothesis testing where you uh, want to, um, uh, well, accept your uh, hypothesis, but it's more also about, uh, and that's what this slide is about, that you have your N of 1 trials 
and um, also all the available evidence that you can bind together with your results into a posterior probability of the effect. And I think the really nice thing about N of 1 trials and Bayesian statistics is that you can also, again, make this condition that you're interested in, and especially in N of 1 trials, you can uh, weigh this minimal clinical important difference uh, into the equation and make sure that you really answer the question, what is the probability or the chance that this patient is uh, going to um, well, be treated with a clinical effect to treatment A, treatment B, or another treatment. Um, and the other interesting part why N of 1 trials have renewed interest is that it's not only about the individual patient to find the optimal treatment for that individual patient, but that you can also use this Bayesian hierarchical model, multi-level model that's shown here, um, um, to uh, simultaneously have an answer to this important question on all the levels of interest. So you can have this first level of interest, uh, just one patient and these different treatments that you're testing, but also um, subgroup levels and the total group level. And this means that you can really, from starting with N of 1 trials, can have an um, alternative, an innovative alternative to the randomized controlled trial that enables also personalized medicine. Um, coming from my own PhD that's almost finished, um, as most PhDs say, your PhD is, well, for a long time almost finished, but this is the, the, the major paper that came out. And we tested an aggregated N of 1 trial in, in patients with a rare muscle disease, myotonia, so patient experiences a muscle stiffness and an off-label drug, mexalatine. Uh, it was published in 2018, and I don't want to go into all details, but I think you might appreciate um, one of the main figures that is shown here. So instead of, and this is more or less what you're used to in large randomized controlled trials, to have a um, median effect with a confidence interval on the group level, here you can also see all the individual uh, treatment effects on a patient level. So each number represents a patient. Um, and for this aggregated N of 1 trial, patients had this adaptive, flexible design and they um, uh, could be admitted to one to four treatment sets of four weeks, drugs and placebo. Uh, what you can see here is that um, this shows the large heterogeneity of the effect over this population, but also the possibility to uh, identify the responders that are in the top right corner here. So a higher score in this graph means uh, a high treatment effect. But also that the non-responders are at the lower left corner here. And the colors here resemble the genetic background of this mutation. Sorry, of this patient. So you can see a clear genetic effect um, that's informing uh, the treatment effectiveness. Uh, another thing, and that's why the subtitle of the slide says it's validation of innovative trial design, was that um, in the lower part of the figure here, that after um, putting data from each individual patient in the aggregated analysis, already after 11 patients, we had a high probability of having a treatment effect on the group level. And in comparison to a normal, conventional, randomized controlled trial that was performed previously, um, uh, well, we clearly showed that this uh, model is uh, much more efficient and also enables the personalized medicine. Um, and um, I would like to introduce uh, Giannina Christian. She is a, a very talented PhD who is now working together with our team with Hilgo and the other collaborators to make sure that we can use this aggregated N of 1 trials in the setting of neurodevelopmental disorders. So can we please start the video? Hi, I'm Janina. I'm a PhD student in the Developmental Disorder Precision Medicine Research Group. My role is going to be uh, focusing on the performing aspect, which is twofold. It has to do with N of 1 uh, trials as well as individualized treatment predictions. In essence, we want to know what 
individual treatment works for each patient and we want to aid clinician decisions. Uh, so what we will be doing is we will be implementing a decision support system with the help of machine learning tools applied to EEG biomarkers as well as uh, individual patient characteristics. With the help of patient statistics, we can make use of previous uh, information and incorporate it into our current study. Previous information can take the form of information from previous studies, clinicians' expertise, as well as information on uh, the same patient, which is previously available. My hope is that our work is going to improve prognosis in, in future patients yeah, yeah. and that it will extrapolate to other fields as well. Uh, so my uh, last uh, few slides, um, I would like um, to well present to you why I think the N of 1 trials and neurodevelopmental disorders are such a great match. So at first, uh, we are dealing with a heterogeneous population with relative uh, pervasive symptomatology. So for N of 1 trials, the basic concept is that um, these are you should study chronic stable disorders uh, to uh, allow these multiple comparisons in time and to limit your carryover and period effects. Um, so on the other hand, for the Bayesian uh, approach, um, it's nice to have a lot of trial data, uh, but also preclinical data for your prior elicitation. So you want to combine this evidence that is already there so that your individual N of 1 trial does not stand on its own. You want it to be something with an evidence update synthesis. Um, uh, well, Klaus and Niels uh, clearly demonstrated that there is uh, a lot of uh, innovative uh, um, research going on if we're talking about physiological outcome measures with the FEI framework um, that is um, well being performed on EEG measurements but also on the stem cell of, uh, of patients. And um, last but not least, there is this availability of promising drugs that actually work within the designated framework of this uh, uh, well, FEI framework. Um, another thing that I'm uh, quite enthusiastic about is that Bayesian analysis can not only be used uh, in this N of 1 trial uh, analysis, but you can also reanalyze uh, frequentistically, so using normal statistic um, uh, randomized controlled trial uh, to make sure that you also um, uh, have all the benefits of a Bayesian approach. That is what uh, Giannina is um, in the process of doing so at the moment. So we use the Bambi trial data, the RCT that Hilgo already talked about, the bumetanide trial. And um, we try to not only um, stand the data, let the data stand on its own, but also make sure that we combine it with prior assumptions about the effectiveness of uh, bumetanide. Um, and we use an expert panel uh, to derive these priors from. And we also incorporate all the previous bumetanide trials. Um, so in a way, this is a meta-analysis, but also with other information parts that normally you don't um, include into your uh, Cochrane reviews, for example. Um, so this minimal clinical important estimation for all the outcome measures, that's what we are working on, that you can make sure what is the cutoff for these different outcome measures, when do we think it's clinically uh, meaningful. Uh, these clinical priors are being elicited from uh, experts and, uh, well, we're going to use it uh, to inform uh, uh, future uh, trials. That was my uh, last slide and I stole this one from Niels because it's uh, such a nice slide. Uh, um, it's all about team science and I want to uh, thank um, um, and mention the N of 1 trial team from the Radboud UMC that um, also exists um, uh, with Gert-Jan van der Wild uh, and Hans Groenewoud from the Department of Health Evidence. So thank you very much uh, for the attention. Yeah, you have a lovely team picture. This was a, this was a team lecture, right?
is definitely meant so to be one. Yes. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, you, you I hope it came off. Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were, you, yeah, you were we a fine team. Enough repetitions, I think, to make it clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the, yeah, you have the nice group picture, so it's, it's all, uh, it's all uh, included. That's very nice. Uh, before we answer questions, because uh, questions are coming in, and please uh, uh, keep uh, entering them, but also vote for the ones you find most interesting, so we can discuss it later, a little later. But for now, team, uh, this is a special moment, right? Yeah. Something special is going to happen, to be revealed. Complete philosophy of team science, but also to link to patients and care workers. We thought, how are we going to name this effort? Because it's about science, it's about clinical care, it's about involving stakeholders, industries, that we wanted to find a good name and a yes. tagline that we want to reveal today. Let's reveal it. <laughs> You like it, Nils? You said yeah, nice. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, nice animation also. And then also yeah. a nice animation. Just special a moment. A special moment. Well, uh, well Bas, explain N is you. <laughs> well, well, N is you. Uh, I must say, all creds go, uh, especially to Hilgo, about the name. We, yeah, he came up with it. Well, we had a, a lot of discussion about uh, uh, <laughs> proper names. N is one, uh, me, you should, of course, be attractive <laughs> to children. Uh, but I think Hilgo can uh, better explain um, all the logic about it. But I really like it because it's simple, it's clear, it stands for the precision center yeah. and N of one. So, of course, N is, is in it, and I'm N is one. Expert, so I'm very happy with uh, a lot of NS1 it being lots, in it. Lots of attention yeah. for NS1. Yeah, it's logical, yeah, we right? We particularly try to sympathize you and with this name, yeah. Okay, yes. <laughs> well, it's sort of a next level algorithm, eh? so the Amsterdam UMC mm. really likes algorithms that somebody really understands what the, the center is for, and I think this is a very good combination indeed of a sympathetic name about both Im the ambition but also the emotion that we really focus the on the individual. Yes, so, yeah, true. Yeah. Lovely, congratulations. Thank on you. That one. We have questions here uh, regarding NS1 as well. Um, uh, I'll, I'll propose a question you just answer when you feel uh, the need to answer, right? Peter, thank you for your question. Uh, in these NS1 trials, how do you differentiate a treatment effect from an intervention from developmental changes in a child? I think that's interesting. Yeah. Who wants to go? Well, I think that's a particular child psychiatric question and I think yep. it's a very very good question because indeed not only for treatment effects it's very difficult sometimes to differentiate whether somebody has a developmental defect or a delay in development yep. and how these two interact mm -hmm. and what you should do about it and whether you can expect a spontaneous improvement yeah. of development I think that's also an element of this question exactly but on the other hand, for especially with bumetanide, for instance, it, if we think we mature the synapse a little bit, that the treatment effect in itself can be developmental gain. Mm. And actually, some of our outcome measures try to assess whether a developmental delay is caught up by treatment. So the two are not necessarily indistinguishable or separate, but it is very true that we should keep an eye on thinking are we dealing with developmental delay, developmental defect or both, mm -hmm. and to differentiate this when we do this careful treatment monitoring. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see a question from John, and um, many people voted for that. I see a lot of research relying on machine learning to explain which parameters of a model explain the most variance. Do we lose anything by relying so much on these <coughs> types of models? Well, let's give that to uh, gentlemen. I, I, <laughs> I, I would maybe turn it around and say, yeah. you, if you do not do machine learning, you definitely lose something uh, yeah. because then you decide to turn a blind eye to some of the parameters that has information about the the clinical status. I can see that, but what what, what do you think that the question asker is coming from with this question? Uh, that is a very good what, question. What, <laughs> what is the what is the risk that that you take when you well, depend on machine learning? There there is one thing. Maybe that's the question. So mm. machine learning is about what we call supervised. So mm. you make, you choose upfront what you want to differentiate with your classifier, for instance. 
And it really depends what your choice is there. So if you start explaining classes that, for instance, lack any other clinically relevant item, then you might skip that. So it's very important to keep on thinking and to also to use super unsupervised and supervised me methods next to one another. So then you won't also, lose that yeah. much. Okay. Well, at least then you can keep an eye on what, what really drives your model and what do we want to put in the model, what is clinically relevant. So mm -hmm. that's where we need this interaction between science and clinical genuine observations. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, to answer your question, mm -hmm. I think the, the root of this question is probably that there's some suspicion about this black box. Exactly. So if there are a little bit too many parameters in there, mm -hmm. is it actually uh, um, fishing for effects? Is it reproducible? Can mm -hmm. we uh, physiologically interpret it? Yeah. And, uh, but I think that has to do with also developing better visualization tools for what is actually in that black box. Yes. That's so it. that we can interpret, so, yeah. it, interpret the different components of it. Okay. Nice. Maybe Bas can comment on if you do use more probabilistic uh, statistics, how you can also overcome some of these elements of black boxes and overfitting? Hmm. Mm, well, I must say that in the context of machine learning, I, I haven't been uh, that experienced in using Bayesian statistics. But of course, well, you're right that with probabilistic statistics, it's more or less the same because uh, certain skepticism also um, is there with Bayesian probabilistic statistics, but there you make sure that all the subjective information that you put into your analysis, yeah. that it's clear in all kinds of sensitivity analysis to make sure what is subjective and what is not. So maybe that's something that I can say from Bayesian statistics where also... Uh, mm, thank you so much. Niels, question for you. Yes. Do you. Do you think the addition of iPSC-based diagnostics for this application depends on the presence of a known functio functional mutation? Or can patients without a clear genetic cause also benefit? Yes, well, I think it's a Mark very, Mizet, thank very you. good question. Mm. Um, first of all, I think we don't want to claim that uh, diagno diagnostics should be based on cellular assays alone, right? So I think the message of today is really that it's one of the assays that we use together with all the assays that are presented today and even maybe more and also genetic information to come to a good diagnosis. But I think, having said that, I think definitely, I think it can be very valuable um, a diagnostic tool, especially for um, situations where there is no clear genetic cause, yeah. and then there can still be um, uh, prominent cellular phenotypes. And if you can detect those, that can be a good indication um, uh, what what is going on in the patient. And also, I think what is really great is that we can then test uh, some of the drugs that uh, Hilgo discussed mm -hmm. already on the cellular level before we test this in the patient. Oh yeah. And I think that is also a very uh, promising. Um, aspect of this uh, technology. Promising developments. Thank you. Thank what you. Do you. What do you like? Steve Hyman last year, at this moment, he claimed that genetic causality is the only way forward if we, if we use those kind of models. Mm. Yeah. So I think, uh, and that's where we the, the monogenetic um, uh, mutations come in. I think. I think first, of course, you have to to prove and to establish that this uh, whole framework is is working. So I think, uh, if you know genetic genetic cause, especially if is it monogenetic, it's easy to uh, also reproduce in other situations, then this can help us to understand how uh, valid these assays are and, and see if it can connect it to other levels um, that uh, are also analyzed here uh, by the other um, presenters here at the table. Right. And that's a kind of a proof of concept um, that we go mm. through. But I, I think at the end it would be nice if we can show that, that it works and then we can also apply this knowledge to um, diseases that have, don't have a clear genetic cause. Cause, yes. Thank you, thank you so much. So far there are more questions here, and I know that you will have more questions for these gentlemen at the table, but we are proceeding towards breakout sessions where they will be uh, together. Hilgo and Bas, Niels and Klaus, they will split up and be in a, in a breakout we'll room at Zoom with you. Yeah. But uh, no, no, but it, th th there will be time. But, but now, uh, before you go there, uh, we really uh, need to, to uh, do something special. Yes. Um, and that's why uh, I see two gentlemen. Uh... <laughs> so this is a surprise. <laughs> this was surprise. Corona surprise distance. <laughs> so um, Hilgo, uh, Niels, Bas, and Klaus, uh, this is actually the first time that we're going to award a team award. So Amsterdam Neuroscience is going to give away the first team award in five years, and then we think you should take, you know, the honor of receiving this award and taking care of it. This is by way of saying a warm welcome to you in Amsterdam. 
Congratulations <laughs> on the great name of your expertise center. And way to go, man. Okay. There you go. Thank you very, very much. Yes. Well, we cannot uh, shake. We cannot hug. We cannot no, hug. We cannot. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. <laughs> hug from distance. Yay! 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 Bravo! <laughs> well. To you. Yes. Well, this makes this day even more special. Thank right. you very, very much. It You're is. welcome. Yeah. It's kind of pretty, right? That's There's a brain there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank like you. A hologram, yeah. That's yeah. why I stopped you. People are still voting on your statements. What we're going to do now is I'm going to ask you, gentlemen, to uh, step up and move to your breakout room. And then, yeah, go. You can go now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because then I'll start talking yeah. until you are there. <laughs> Lots of fun. And meanwhile, Arjen and Diederik will do a, a small dance. No, don't do that. That's, <laughs> no, it's prohibited. You cannot dance. Not sing, no singing or dancing. And um, you uh, find the link below in your screen. And then you can just choose. Click, and then you'll be in the breakout room. And we will uh, be back here at 2.30 for the Pecha Kucha segment, also a competition. And uh, many uh, new faces will be here to present in Pecha Kucha style. And uh, I know that uh, Arjen and Diederik now with a mask, but they really are them, uh, will be joining us uh, for the rest of the day as well. So, hit the button, and I think that these men will be ready to join you now. <laughs>